Hello, this is Daniel Posny, and this is called Shifting Perspectives, and this will be about a 10-15 minute talk about a certain topic, and today um, is going to be about uh, Byron Katie's work called The Work. But first, I want to let you know that um, there's a men's retreat coming up in October. It's going to be a four-day retreat here in Sedona with elements at our two-acre property in Cornville. Um, we've got a purification lodge for a fire ceremony and sweat. We have a medicine wheel and we have the creek going right by our house. So we've got lots of elements here to kind of expand what we normally do. Really excited about that. Um, the other thing that's going on is Valerie is still in Costa Rica for another six uh, days or so. She's uh, coming off of 21 day water fast and uh, she's getting refed with coconut water and juice and maybe some watermelon, which is like a spiritual experience after you've gone through something like that, apparently. So, um, and I just got off of uh, gallbladder surgery and recovering really nicely, really no pain, just took it really easy, had people come over and mow my lawn and, you know, fill up my pellet stove and, you know, bring me soup and all kinds of good stuff. So now I'm feeling like I really want to go do some work, but that's the part I need to be really careful about because you know, could, um, could push myself. So I'm just still taking it easy. So here we are uh, for um, talking about the work. And um, before I go into Byron Katie and what it's all about, uh, our biggest problem is, well, like, like uh, Dr. Gabor Mate talks about trauma, he says, it's not the, the traumatic experience, which is the most painful. I'm going to paraphrase here, but it's, it's not the traumatic experience. It's, it's actually what where we go to after that, what the, the effect, the negative effects it has on our life after that. If you've ever had a conversation or um, learned about people that are addicts uh, on the street, um, on fentanyl or any kind of uh, addictive drug, drug like that, that's their life. If you were to talk to them about where they started, it's, you know, a lot of times it's just one thing, one traumatic sexual abuse or um, abu um, physical or psychological abuse at the home and cause them to make a decision about themselves and a belief about themselves. And that took them down this road and they never found the, the courage or the need or the, the trust that they could talk about this. And so it took them down this road. So this whole thing about the work and what I want to talk about is it's the it's the mind that um, has a perception, it has a has a thoughts and beliefs, and it something happens on the outside, and your mind takes you into this place that's you have no proof about that. Like if you were to take sometimes your belief and your thoughts about someone or something or yourself, you were to take that into court and litigate that, and you'd say, show us some proof. You know, just we're just dealing in facts here. So. Um, the work is all about kind of questioning that, kind of challenging that. But I want to make sure that I'm clear that it's not about challenging your emotions and your feelings about it. Your emotions and your feelings about it are completely real. And going through the book that I'm reading, which is uh, Loving What Is with Byron Katie, I haven't got to the part where they acknowledge and validate the emotions yet. Maybe I, maybe I missed it, but that part I want just want to make sure that it's really clear. This is not about invalidating how you feel and the emotions that you're having about it. It's just that that extended dragging on of thoughts and beliefs about what that makes you feel about yourself and the world and about this person and about your relationship. You know what I'm talking about, the monkey mind that just goes off on this. So if you have an inner belief about that you're not worthy or you're not enough, then you're going to go into basically all your relationships with that subconscious belief going on in the background that you're not going to get that interview or you're not going to be able to provide for your kids or you're not going to be able to uh, provide in that relationship. So the work is about kind of questioning, okay, what is your current belief about this? What's your longstanding core belief? I'm not enough or people abandon me or people betray me or something. And you might say, you know, the question would be, the first one is, is it true? Is it true that everyone betrays you? Yes, I see it. You know, everyone betrays me, every single person. Okay, 
are you completely 100 percent um sure that that is the case that is true and like i had to do that for myself about relationships and so my thing was i had this little thing that i discovered that i was believing that um i had betrayal in my relationships and just like the mind works you know the mind picks up on the the, the it negates all the positive and it looks at the negative and focuses on that just like it watches a movie or reads a book it'll negate all the the good stuff but when it gets to the end and if it's crappy then it focuses on that and it just like it's dumping the baby out with the bath water so i don't know if you know this but the that term dumping the baby out um taking the baby out with the bath water is when uh people didn't have a lot of hot water and there was no electricity they would cook their water to, to boil it and the man of the house usually got the, the first you know part of the water and then after his grease and grime and <laughs> everything else then maybe the wife would get the next and then after her then the oldest kid and then the next oldest kid and then at the end was the baby <laughs> So they, they would say that the water was so murky with all that stuff from everyone taking their, their bath that be careful not to <laughs> throw the baby without the, out with the bath water. So that's where that term supposedly came up, came from. So it's just this idea that, you know, uh, you don't believe in the religion that yoga is uh, connected to. So you're going to not do yoga. It's that kind of thing. That's called throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So we're just getting really clear on what the belief is that if you believe that you have betrayal in all of your relationships or a majority of your relationships, what I needed to do is look at my relationships and kind of, again, like kind of litigate that. Okay, let's look at every single one. And I had to look at over 20 relationships, however short they were, and say, was I betrayed there? Well, she did like this other boy and I was 12 years old and I thought that was a betrayal, but maybe that was just innocent love and, you know, newness and that kind of thing. Then I had to kind of, yeah, scoot that one to the side. And then there's another one where this, this boy um, uh, was trying to play my girlfriend at the time. And I didn't really know myself. I didn't have that confidence and he had loads of confidence. And so he got her. And so she didn't really betray me. It was just kind of my thing, actually, that I didn't have that together yet. But, you know, I was 15 or 16. Maybe I was, yeah, maybe 16, 17. Still, I didn't have it together. Um, and then there was another one that was, I thought it was a betrayal. So really what I'm getting at is there may have been one, maybe one and a half out of 20. So the feeling of the betrayal was completely real. It, it really took me down. But if I'm really honest with myself, I was really deeply insecure on so many levels. So of course I'm gonna feel betrayal and things would look like that a lot. But if I really looked at it, then I start to, okay, wait a minute. If you weren't really betrayed and there were some insecurities going on with that, is there something that you could take responsibility for? All right, so then I look at these questions again. Okay, is it true? I thought it was true. Is it really 100% true? You sure it's true? Well, not really anymore. And then the next question is, what does that do to you? When you believe that people, your relationships betray you or every woman you get in a relationship with, she's gonna hook up with some other guy. What does that do for you? Well, probably makes me feel even more insecure and I try and build myself up somehow or Maybe I follow her all around to make sure that she's not talking or, you know, having any kind of conversation with, you know, see where that goes. That's what it would do to me. And then the next question, number four question is, who would you be? And actually, I, and I want to say is, who would you need to be? Who would you become without that belief? Wow, that one. I know it's, it's a really simple process, but it's one that uh, it really worked for her, this Byron Katie. So it's, her story is um, back in the 80s, she was not having a good life. Her marriage really wasn't good. She was going through depression. She was going through uh, agoraphobia, which is really not feeling safe in your environment. Um, so all these things were happening and she kind of checked herself into a place 
And then she had a couple of weeks at her home to kind of self-reflect. And she had this epiphany that it was kind of like, every time I listen to my thoughts, I suffer. <laughs> every time I don't, hmm, I don't suffer. <laughs> and, you know, if you're new to this, there's this idea that, what do you mean, listen to my thoughts or not listen to my thoughts? They're my thoughts. They're what make me up. Well, sort of, but not really. Who you really are is the one that's aware that you're having thoughts. And then you have the thought, and then you latch onto that, and you believe, it, and you follow it down that path, and then that becomes who you are. That becomes your belief and your um, personality and all that. But before all that, you're this just aware. If you look at the beginning, you're just this awareness, this loving awareness, which I've, I've talked about many times. So if this is new, it's kind of like it's it may be a little challenging to say, is it really true? And, you, and there's this force inside of you that says, yes, damn it, it is true. But the challenge becomes, could you just pull back from that? Could you just Imagine that someone, something inside of you is one is maybe speaking for you. That there's kind of two um, aspects of you that are trying to get met. That there's the thought and beliefs and the egoic side of you that is always on launching into reaction mode. And then there's a, this other side of you that really just wants to be loved and to love, just wants to completely open yourself up to there. And so those questions really kind of open that up and kind of ask those questions, okay, all right, so if that's not really true and it does make you this way, which is not really a happy person, then what would you be if you didn't have that belief that you're not lovable, that you're not enough? And right at this moment, like especially this one about not being enough, right at that moment, there's this, I can feel it, there's this tendency of, I don't really want to not believe that. Or I don't believe that I can not believe that. You know, how does that even happen? I don't believe that I'm enough. And so um, how can I stop that when those thoughts come up? Well, I know this sounds really simple, oversimplified, but you just choose not to believe it. And it's, and it's not about um, thinking positively because now you're back in the mind and you're trying to train the mind that is some, sometimes untrainable. It has, if it's on a track and it believes that, you kind of need to like assert yourself that you're not going to make that choice anymore. Like sometimes the choice is, um, I know I have it, but there's not much I can do about it. So um, it's just as it, as it is, as it, as it is. And that's the choice. But I'm asking if you could take a, like a radical choice of just, just not feeding into it at all at all and when it when it comes in pull back from from feeding it and then when it comes in so strongly that you find yourself talking in that way just forgive yourself and then come back to just not keep feeding it because what happens is that it's like a it's almost like you're gorging yourself on these this idea and you just got to stop gorging yourself <laughs> so i know it seems like i'm oversimplifying this that just to make a choice not to do it but you are making a choice when you do it. So you can make a choice not to do it. It's just that you've made a choice to do it, to, to talk this way, to believe these things. And then you just stop there and you decide to not believe that there's anything you can do about it. It's just, oh my gosh, I just have this thing. So there needs to be this, like, you need to find yourself again. And a lot of times when we have unhealthy boundaries, we don't know what our own needs are. And we don't believe that we can pull ourselves back from this long-standing belief about not being enough and not being worthy and all those things. But it really is just become to practice and it does work. But you have to commit to kind of standing in that, like becoming the captain of your ship again. And this process of the work kind of really looks right into their right you know, right at the, at the, um, the distortion of your belief. And he really kind of asks you that question, like you're really on the stand. Isn't it true, Daniel, <laughs> that most of your relationships have been loving relationships? Well, yeah, if you look at the statistics, <laughs> 
So, and then the last one, the last part of this, after you ask those four questions, is it true? Are you sure it's true? What does it do to you? What, what do you become? And then um, uh, what would you be without that belief? The last part of this is the turnaround. So let me share with you uh, like an example of a turnaround. So here's the, the teaching. Uh, is it true? Can you absolutely, as, absolutely know that it's true? How do you react? What happens when you believe that thought? And then who would you be without the thought? And then the turnaround is, uh, let's see, as a way of experiencing the opposite of the thought that one is believing. For example, the thought, my husband should listen to me, can be turned around to, I should listen to my husband, or I should listen to myself, or my husband shouldn't listen to me. <laughs> I know that sounds wild, but it's, it really is amazing when you really get open to that, um, that I need to be heard. Well, do you hear yourself? When you talk, do you hear yourself and you have compassion for yourself? When you hear the words that come out of your mouth, do you listen to what you're saying? Do you, do you look deeply into that? Where does that come from? And if you can imagine your soul or some spirit, God, source, energy outside of yourself listening to you, and that source going, how come you don't listen to me? <laughs> you know? So what, what this is saying is that you can turn it around for whatever you're saying that you need. Maybe that person needs it from you. Or maybe you don't really need that. Maybe there's something else that you need. And so it's, it really questions that there is a possibility, a strong possibility that you could turn around that phrase that you end up saying a lot, you know, I'm not lovable. Well, maybe you are lovable. Or maybe uh, what you show is not loving sometimes. You know, there's this real kind of honest inquiry going on with what usually comes out of your mouth. So uh, if you want to look at the book and get more in, in depth with this, it's called Loving What Is with Byron Katie. There we go. Um, I mean, it's, it's super simple. There's only, you know, four steps, but she kind of gives all these examples of how you can work it because uh, part of the work is engaging in the person and doing the dance with the person that relates to them. So it's not quite just a cookie cutter. It's about really listening to the person and you know what, what my purpose or what my role would be is to go into the feelings of it, go to the emotions of, yeah, okay, it's true that it's not true, but we still, we're still left with this thing that you feel like shit. You, feel, you still feel unloved. So there's still that part of it to work on. That's all I got. Um, I hope you're doing well and I hope you feel blessed and loved. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you next time.